this man has been called an atrocious blasphemer, a historian of horrible dreams, an assembler of all crimes and filth, a monster author. He has also been called one of the most remarkable men of the 18th century, the most free spirit to ever live, a glory of France, a martyr. By his own lights, he was a libertine. And today, you remember him in your secret BDSM fantasies as the reason behind the word sadist. Donatien Alphonse Francois, Marquis de Sade. Born 1740, died 1814. The Marquis was and is a controversial figure. But was he truly evil or a misunderstood genius? Prepare yourselves as we look at three of the scandals that shook de Sade's life and that defined his legend. The first scandal that received widespread attention in Dessard's life was the Keller Affair. It was Easter Sunday, 1768. Dessard was 27 years old. Outside Paris's Place des Victoires, Dessard met a 36-year-old unemployed widow by the name of Rose Keller. According to Keller, Dessard offered her employment as a housemaid if she would accompany him back to his cottage, a place he had rented in secret in the town of Arkell. On this condition, she agreed to join him, and they began the hour-long journey by carriage to the property. However, once they arrived, Saad began to reveal his true intentions. He forced Keller into a small dark room, and he demanded that she strip fully naked. If she refused, he threatened to kill her and bury her body in the garden. Keller began to undress, but reaching her underwear, she stopped, her eyes filled with tears, and she insisted that she had come to take the position as a maid, nothing more. Dessard at this point flew into a sexually driven rage. He grabbed her, he tore off her underwear himself, and he forced her face down onto the bed. It was now that Sard's actions turned darker than any shade of grey. He pinned Keller down, as he flayed her with both a cat of nine tails and a cane. He slashed her body multiple times with a small blade, and he poured hot wax into her now lacerated flesh. He even added a special ointment to the wounds with the sole purpose of intensifying her pain and of increasing his own pleasure. The ordeal only came to an end when, in the delight of her agony, the Marquis let out, in Keller's own words, very loud and very terrifying shrieks at the moment he reached climax. It was then when Dessard left the room that Keller saw her opportunity to escape. She climbed out of the second story window and, bloody and beaten though she was, managed to find help. She later reported Dessard's actions to the police, explaining to them in detail what had happened and claiming that she had feared for her life. This was, at least, Keller's version of events and it was the version that the media of the time spread quite literally all across Europe, giving Dessard his first taste of widespread infamy. Yet despite our taste for sensationalism, which we still share today with Sard's contemporaries, we should also let him have his say. In June of the same year, when indicted for the crimes, the Marquis gave his deposition in court, and his version of events combined with the facts may give us some reason to rethink the extent of de Sard's sadistic nature. First, Sard categorically denied cutting Keller, and he denied any use of an ointment applied to cause her more pain, claims which were later corroborated by the surgeon who examined Keller. The surgeon said that, from what he could tell, Keller's body had not been lacerated, and when he asked to examine her further, just to make sure, she refused. And second, Dessard claimed that he never offered Keller work as a maid. Rather, she was a prostitute who had willingly joined Sard for what he had described to her as a party du libertine arch, to which she had fully agreed. On this point, it is worth noting also that the Place de Victoire, where the two had met, was at the time a well-known area for soliciting prostitutes. So, what really happened that night, we may never know for sure. But we do know the outcome. Keller obtained a substantial sum 
from Dassard's wife's family to drop the charges. And Saad lay the foundations for his reputation as a sadistic depraved libertine for generations to come. The Marquis's second scandal is known as the Affair of the Poisoned Sweets. It was June 27th, 1772, four years after the Keller Affair. Dassard and his trusted valet, a man known as Latour, had travelled to Marseille. While in the city, they rounded up four working girls, aged between 18 and 23, with the intention of having an orgy. The night began in typical Sardian fashion, although it leaned more towards masochism than sadism. One by one, the girls were told to flay Sard with a parchment that bristled with rusty nails, and to beat him with an old wooden broom, all while Dassard and Latour pleasured each other. Dassard, during the lashings, even managed to meticulously carve the number of blows he received into a wooden mantelpiece, an impressive 758 in all. But these actions were not the source of the scandal. That would come down to two other acts that took place that day. The first was the sexual activity between the Marquis and his valet. One of the girls was forced to watch while Dassard was sodomized by Latour. This had serious repercussions for both men, as at the time, sodomy was a crime punishable by death. And second was the issue of the poisoned sweets. Dassard gave the girls homemade sweets made from Spanish fly, a popular aphrodisiac at the time with mild laxative effects. His intention, which he made explicit to the girls, was to cause them to fart so that he could, in his own words, take the wind into his mouth. The problem is that these sweets made two girls very sick. One girl from the orgy, and later a fifth girl, that Dassard had visited separately. It was this latter girl who reported Saad to the police, stating that she had been poisoned, and it was her report that led to the earlier events of the day coming to light. The consequences for the two men were, even for the time, extreme. Despite sodomy usually going unpunished, and despite the two girls quickly recovering from their illness and withdrawing their charges, both Dassard and Latour were sentenced to death. Fortunately for the pair, they escaped to Italy, avoiding execution and remaining on the run for some years to come. Nevertheless, due to the public backlash, the scandal reached almost farcical levels, and effigies of the two men were symbolically executed in their absence. Of these events, Dassard would later write in fictional form. When informed of the news that he was to be burned in effigy, the Marquis pulled his c**k out of his trousers and yelled, F God, now I'm where I always wanted to be, heaped with scandal and infamy. Wait a minute, I must jerk off. Now, if these scandals had been the peak of Dassard's infamy, we would not be talking about him today. He would be just another aristocratic playboy, forgotten to history. It is the final scandal that raised the tide of his earlier transgressions to legendary status. It is his literature. It was during his first prolonged stay in prison, between 1777 and 1790, primarily during his time in the Bastille, that Dassard the novelist was born. Incarcerated in body, he would be liberated in mind. Today, his most notorious work is The 120 Days of Sodom. Written in 37 days, in tiny handwriting on a 12 meter long scroll, it was thought to have been lost in the storming of the Bastille in 1789, a loss for which Dassard claims to have wept tears of blood. But as it happened, and unbeknownst to Dassard, the work was saved, and over a century later, it resurfaced for publication in 1904. The novel depicts the increasing depravity of four wealthy libertines, who imprison their victims, including 16 specially selected children, aged between 12 and 15, deep in the bowels of a German castle. Over a period of four months, the libertines seek their ultimate sexual gratification, through a progressive process of abuse and torture, that eventually leads to the death of the victims. The scenes range from Dassard's usual preferences for flagellation to immeasurably worse forms of sexual torture and mutilation. All forms of bodily excretions are consumed, women have their fingers torn off, 
children are skinned alive, newborn babies are killed in front of their mothers, and pregnant women are disemboweled, all in the name of pleasure. There is no debate that the scenes described are, indeed, a disturbing collection of crimes and filth. Since, however, the work was thought to be lost in his lifetime, it is not this work that caused Assad the greatest scandal in his day. That honour falls on two of his other works, Justine and Juliet. Justine and Juliet are sisters whose individual stories represent two sides of the same coin. Justine is a committed Christian who refuses to stray from Christian ideals, but who, as a result, experiences nothing but abuse and misery. While Juliet is an immoral nymphomaniac murderer who does everything and anything to benefit herself and who subsequently experiences great happiness and success. Both of these works, as with the 120 Days of Sodom, depict extreme scenes of depravity, including sexual abuse, killing, torture, and even cannibalism. And it was the violent depictions of these two novels that were considered, by Napoleon Bonaparte no less, to be too perverse for society to bear. In 1801, Napoleon ordered the arrest of the anonymous author of Justine and Juliet, known to be Dessart and as a result, Saad would end up spending the final 13 years of his life incarcerated in prisons and a mental asylum. Nevertheless, the explicit content of these novels is perhaps not the only reason for which de Saad lost his liberty. There is more to Justine and Juliet than mere perversion and immorality. In the unravelling of these tales, Saad reveals what lurks in the darkness of all authoritarian regimes, and he provided a demonstration of the arbitrary abuses of power that existed in his day, whether by monarchs, judges, priests, or even enlightened despots. This is why Dessard's novels are thought to be heavily autobiographical, not just because they reflect his own sexual transgressions, but because he reveals firsthand the abuses of power that take place in society, abuses that he had experienced firsthand, both as an abuser and a victim. As Geoffrey Guerrero, an early biographer of Dessard, points out, no authoritarian government could allow the exposure of the mechanisms of despotism contained in Justine and Juliet. Perhaps we may therefore think, not just of Dessard as a deranged mind, but as an early whistleblower. As we reach the end of this video, let us know what you think. Was Dessard's greatest crime his sexual deviancy? Or was it his ability to reveal, in graphic detail, the corruption and immorality of the powers that existed in his day? Thanks for watching this production by Immaterial Minds. Please remember to subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.